Hello, everyone. I am very excited here to be talking today with Professor Matthew McManus, who is, uh, by the way, you're the first case that I've had twice. So uh, oh, you're the cool. uh, first repeat guest. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Professor Matthew McManus, the last time we talked, you were in a different college, now you're in University of Michigan. Uh, and you're the author of multiple books and I can, uh, your output is so prolific that I cannot even keep track of it, uh, whether it's of articles or books. So the most recent of which is on Nietzsche and the politics of reaction. It's going to be out in January, 2023, I think. Yeah, something like that. I mean, fuck, we're working really hard to get the edits done. So as soon as that's finished, you'll, as soon as that's done, you'll know. All right. So, well, I'll read it and we'll do a separate session on that as well. Uh, but today, I want to start by talking uh, to you about reactionary politics, because mm -hmm. uh, you're a con chronicler of conservative thought, because you read all of the conservative books that come out recently. So let's start by talking about something that you wrote recently on Alexander Dugan. Now, oh, yeah. before we get into Michael Millerman and his uh, views on Dugan, uh, why don't you give us a brief intro of who Dugan is and what exactly is his fourth political theory? Sure. So Alexander Dugan is a political theorist or philosopher. Uh, he has a lot of different titles, mostly self-ascribed uh, in Russia, uh, who's become pretty famous recently as a cheerleader uh, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, which he situates in a far bigger geopolitical and indeed metaphysical context, which we can get into, right? But uh, just by way of background, he grew up in a upper middle-ish class family uh, in the Soviet Union. His family is well situated, at least as well situated as it could be. Uh, he himself was never really attracted to communism initially, uh, but there's no doubt that he is spiritually and emotionally broken uh, by the fact that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War, to put it simply, right? Uh, he saw this as shameful, the victory of libertinism, liberalism, capitalism, all these kinds of bad things. Uh, and through the late 1980s, through the 1990s, he responded to this in a number of different ways, including by founding various neo-fascist or quasi or post-fascist parties. There's a lot of different labels applied to them, most notably uh, the National Bolshevik Party. He was an active member within it. Uh, and he also wrote an important book that was really well received by the Russian Military Academy called Foundations of Geopolitics. Um, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, his reputation waned a little bit in the early 2000s, uh, but he's since recovered when he published the fourth political theory, uh, I think in 2009, uh, where he became something of a cult or superstar figure uh, on the alt or far right, uh, especially in online circles where he gained really quite a big audience, uh, even in the Anglosphere, which is ironic considering uh, his description of the United States uh, and Anglo culture generally as uh, a term drawn from Heidegger, planetary idiocy, uh, and he has very little good to say about it. Uh, and since then, you know, again, uh, he's been very prolific. There's no doubt about that. You know, he's published a truly copious number of books and uh, articles, uh, and I think he runs something like three websites right now dedicated to his own work. Uh, people can check him out if he wants, if they want. Uh, I think there are better things for people to do with their time than read Dugan. Uh, it's kind of my job, but if you dare, uh, just make sure you approach it with a very critical disposition. So, uh, Willemann's latest book, uh, Dr. Michael Willemann, who is Putin, uh, Dugan's biggest fanboy in mm -hmm. the West, uh, is titled Inside Putin's Brain. So he is presenting us with a picture that, you know, based on the title itself that, you know, you need to read or take Dugan seriously because this guy has a lot of influence and he is one of the, uh, he's the philosopher who inspires, you know, he's a Rasputin of uh, Vladimir Putin, as mm -hmm. it were. So how influencer is he really in contemporary Russia? Because if you ask me, I think his influence is kind of overstated in Western circles. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely think so. Uh, I mean, certainly 
the idea that Putin is spending his time with some kind of oracle uh, and using that to make his geopolitical decisions is nonsensical. Uh, my suspicion is that Michael did this mostly to drum up sales number as, and uh, take advantage of the conflict to try to you know, plug his book. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say uh, because the Kremlin is not exactly overt uh, about what it's uh, going on inside it. You know, Russia isn't famous uh, as a transparent society. Um, you know, Dugan certainly likes to state that he has a tremendous influence. Uh, and there was a point after his daughter perished uh, in a terrorist attack uh, where Putin referred to him as our philosopher or talked about an attack on our philosopher, which seemed to suggest uh, that he occupies at least an important intellectual position uh, for the regime. Uh, on the other hand, there have been a lot of scholars who pointed out that I mean, he, at his peak before he got kicked off of Twitter, he had something like 30,000 followers, right? Uh, which is a reasonable amount if you're an academic. Uh, it's certainly not a huge amount if you're the ideologue of an entire Eurasian civilization, right? Uh, they pointed out, you know, that the Russian military academy really stopped paying attention to him after he published Foundations of Geopolitics. And a lot of people were actually very critical of that book. Uh, and apparently the regime has at times been quite critical uh, of what Dugan's done and seen him kind of as a useful idiot. You know, you drag him out uh, in order to provide some kind of pizzazz or gusto uh, when you need intellectual justifications. Uh, but when he starts to get a little bit too mouthy, then you shove him back into whatever university uh, you want him to be in uh, and you tell him to, you know, reconcile himself to publishing opaque books on whatever it is he happens to be interested in at the moment. So open question how important he is. Definitely he's not nearly as important as he thinks uh, he is, but... Who knows? This is something that we're going to have to find out about probably decades from now uh, when there's a lot more transparency on these issues. But interestingly enough, for political philosopher, one of the things that you pointed out in your review was that Miller man, for he completely ignores, sidelines the actual policy implications of Dugin's <laughs> ideas as secondary, you know, they, they don't matter. What really matters is this metaphysical, vague, opaque, uh, mystical fascism, you know, roughly speaking, although he would not term it that. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's kind of separating, he's, he's, he's asking us, in other words, to take Dugin seriously as a philosopher. But I have to ask, uh, after reading Dugin and Pillerman, that what exactly is his original contribution to philosophy? I mean, I can understand if, for instance, someone like Nietzsche or Heidegger or Smith, mm -hmm. all of these far-right figures who have had very uh, prominent influence on philosophy. And there is a lot that can be separated in their philosophical work from their politics and a lot that can be applied to both sides of the spectrum. Even someone like Derrida, like Mark yeah. Dooley, for instance, argues that Derrida, you know, can be interpreted in a conservative manner. So, but for Dugin, I, I don't see much in his philosophy as original contribution. So I don't know why exactly he should be taken seriously as a prominent philosopher. And, he shouldn't and be. What is the, what's the argument that Willemann makes, why should we take him seriously? Uh, well, that's a great question, Amash. Uh, first off, I do want to say, just on that point, uh, Michael claims at some point that nothing Duke can say about oil prices uh, could compare to the importance of unraveling his opinions on you know, big philosophical questions, right? Uh, and he says this in a very snide way at the conclusion and in the opening of the book. Uh, I think that's a really stupid position to take, frankly, uh, because while Michael might not be all that interested in oil prices, uh, the millions and billions of people around the globe uh, who are currently suffering or freezing uh, or seeing their lifestyles collapse do think uh, the price of oil is actually quite important. Uh, and this kind of testifies to the very abstract, immaterial quality uh, to the way these people approach Dugan, where the real life implications uh, of his thinking and of the policies he supports just doesn't matter, right? Uh, and it's worth noting, of course, that the main thing that people are critical of uh, when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine conflict isn't actually oil prices, that's important, uh, but of course the fact that this is an imperialist act of aggression against a neighboring state. 
there are a lot of complications to Ukraine Russia conflict, but you know, that's it in essence, right? Uh, and thousands of people have died. And the fact that he's cheerleading on these kinds of atrocities is something that most people would take as a sign that maybe this guy isn't quite on the level, right? So let's just be clear about that from the beginning. In terms of his substantive philosophical positions, uh, which is what he himself wants to be most known for, there's no doubt about that, right? Uh, I agree that he is a minor figure. Uh, I would even call him a clownish figure uh, compared even to other more important figures on the far right. And I want to be very clear here uh, that there are great far right thinkers who I believe are evil men uh, and whose views must be emphatically rejected. People like Schmidt, Nietzsche, or Heidegger. But there's no doubt that they make a substantive intellectual contribution and critique for that matter uh, of egalitarian modernity. Uh, and for those of us who believe in egalitarian modernity, it's incumbent upon us to respond to their positions as systematically and as forcefully as possible. And we have to take them seriously in order to do that, right? Like Nietzsche, as you know, is no joke, right? He's a pretty funny guy at points, uh, but he raises very serious objections against certain egalitarian uh, intuitions. Uh, all that Dugan really contributes, based upon my reading of his work, uh, is a kind of glammed up version, a lot of a lot of these far right fear, like themes, uh, that are kind of updated with the 21st century vocabulary, right? So he's very willing to syncretically draw upon things like postmodern theory, right? Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Lyotard, right? Uh, in order to kind of jazz up a lot of these conventional far right themes. Uh, he's also willing to appropriate the language of egalitarian modernity in a more aggressive way uh, than most far right thinkers uh, are willing to do. Uh, he's kind of like Schmidt, actually, in that sense. So occasionally he'll talk about his Eurasian version of democracy in terms that could be flattering uh, or enticing even to leftists, right? Because uh, he talks about a more authentic, more committed kind of democracy than what you see uh, in the parliamentary West. You know, if you're a Marxist, you might think, well, of course, you know, there's problems with parliamentarianism, so maybe there's something attractive about this. Uh, but it's worth noting again that any deep reading of his work will reveal that there's nothing particularly democratic about the use of this language or particularly democratic about what he's proposing, right? A democracy for Dugan means the commitment of a people to its, or a narod to its destiny. And that destiny is not decided by the people. Uh, so it's not ruled by the people, uh, which is what democracy means. It's decided by the single ones or the singular ones, depending on the translation, right? Philosophers like Dugan, uh, who know what the destiny of the people should be uh, and are entitled to compel them to adhere to it uh, through force and authoritarianism, whatever else it happens to be, right? So uh, again, this sneaky way of smuggling in modernist or democratic sounding language is rather like uh, what he does with postmodern language, right? It can be enticing to some people if they're not on guard about it. Uh, but again, that's not really an original contribution to philosophy uh, because the substance of what he's arguing for is very generic far right bullshit, right? Uh, it's just presented in jazzier terms. Let's just put it that way. So that description reminds me of another Russian philosopher, Ivan Ilin. And mm -hmm. I would argue that everything that you just uh, said about Dugin can be applied to Elin. So it seems to me like he's drawing a lot of his theories about democracy, about say aristocratic uh, form of democracy, because according to Elin was also not against democracy. He would say that democracy should be performative. Like there should be one mm -hmm. leader, but then you should all go to vote for that leader just as a performance just as your performative acceptance of submission to that leader. So Eileen is someone actually, unlike Dugan, Eileen is someone that Putin has repeatedly quoted uh, throughout mm -hmm. his speeches. He quoted Eileen when the Ukraine invasion happened. Uh, he also uh, brought Eileen's body, exhumed Eileen's bodies to bury it in Russia. So mm -hmm. it seems like figures like Eileen is actually more important to study, uh, to understand Putin than someone like Dugin, because whatever influence Dugin seems to have uh, in terms of to Putin, whatever influence, whatever he insights he can give us about the mind of uh, say the Russian oligarchs, the same can be derived from Elin. So 
he is the original source of that seems to me to be philosophers like Ivan. You could very well be right. And I want to be clear. Uh, I'm not an expert on Putinism. And it's important to distinguish Duganism and Putinism, right? Uh, so a couple of people asked me, like, are you saying Putin is a fascist? I'm like, no, 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 I'm saying Dugan is a fascist. Putin, maybe, maybe something else, right? I'll leave it to the people who are more familiar with Russian oligarchy and what's going on there uh, in order to make those kind of judgment calls. Uh, and you could very well be right that Aileen uh, is a more significant figure for someone like Putin. Uh, not having read his work, I can't evaluate it uh, on that basis. I can say, however, uh, that the mode of argumentation you described Eileen is making, right? Again, reconceiving democracy in these aristocratic or authoritarian terms is a very old far-right trick. Uh, probably the most sophisticated practitioner of that was Carl Schmitt, again, right? Uh, who once described dictatorship as potentially democratic, even more democratic than liberal parliamentarianism, if the dictator could actually embody this kind of Rousseauian general will of the people, right? Constitute the people and you know, express their will. Uh, and not only would it be more democratic, because it actually he actually expressed the general will, uh, it could be more effective, uh, since, of course, a dictator would have no checks on his ability to express and to work for uh, the general will, unlike what you see uh, with the checks and balances in liberal parliamentarianism. But you could even go back further, right? Somebody like Joseph de Maestra, who is a profound influence on fascist thinkers like Avola or Schmidt, right? Uh, De Maestra famously argued that monarchy uh, was, in fact, the most elevating kind of political system for the people. So again, drawing on this demotic language, because it allows the people to participate in something that's higher or grander or more sublime uh, than what you find in their everyday life. Now, that doesn't mean the people get to tell the monarch what to do. In fact, their job is to submit to the monarch, right, completely. Uh, and if they don't want to, then, well, there's violence that will be used to back that up, right? Uh, but he does use this language of elevation in a demotic way to try to convince people who are attracted to modern notions of participatory democracy that there's something in monarchy for them, right? Uh, and all these kinds of references uh, are obviously insincere, since what we're just getting is jazzed up versions of authoritarianism. Uh, and I mean, there's nothing particularly sublime or elevated about Putinism. Let's be very clear about that for anyone. Uh, as the Ukraine debacle, I think, is testified to better than anything else, right? But this language can have a very useful ideological uh, impact for the far right. Yeah, I think it serves as a good metaphor. And that, I think, leads us to the fact that Dugin is influential in the American alt-right circles. That is, he's being propped up by Steve Barron and all of these, many of mainstream conservative figures as well. So, uh, I'd just like to how, intervene there and say, uh, even Jordan Peterson had good things to say about Dugan, uh, which is baffling to me. Yes, I don't know if you saw his... Um, little manifesto on Ukraine that he released early uh, in the conflict. Uh, but this is when he was apologizing for the regime, said that there was no chance that the West could actually defeat Russia or the Ukrainians could defeat Russia because the Putin regime showed real will uh, in its war against decadent wokeism. Uh, and he made a reference, a passing reference to Dugin by saying, whatever else you want to say, he's a real philosopher, right? Uh, real meaning, you know, legit right somebody who's deep and profound and conforms to you know this hagiographic paradigm uh which goes to show you two things right one is that uh peterson really is a shitty political commentator who has no sense of how the real world works and two his taste in philosophers since at least maps of meaning has become really appalling right because dugan is a real philosopher if all you mean is somebody who writes books on philosophy right uh but He's a crap philosopher, right? Uh, you shouldn't trust his views about more or less anything unless it's far right propaganda. Well, Peterson, I think, has uh, evolved quite a bit since he talked a year ago. He has turned into, you know, because since a year ago, I would have labeled him sort of moderate. Now he's all in on the anti vaccine shirt and on the climate change, and he tweets at least. 50 times a day, yeah. so. You're absolutely right. I mean, hey, uh, when we wrote that book, Naps of, or Naps of Meaning, <laughs> Myth and Mayhem, uh, let's just critique of Jordan Peterson. The expectation was that, you know, he was a serious intellectual. Uh, he wasn't out there, right? He was making sustained conservative arguments that needed to be dealt with. Uh, in some ways, it's 
not surprising, but it's a little disappointing to see him give so into audience capture or whatever it happens to be. Right? I don't know. But to add to uh, one of the things, the language thing that we're talking about, I think that the same applies to the so-called dark enlightenment because uh, oh, yes. one of the figures that's been gaining a lot of tracks in lately, you know, he was even on Tucker Carlson, so it's quite a sad yeah, yeah. And his whole idea is basically against democracy and he, you know, talks about the cathedral. All of that is basically fascism to me. I don't know how you would describe it. So I have no idea why mainstream conservatives like Tucker Carlson would want to have a conversation with him unless, the fa unless you know, they see him as unless they're racist, white supremacists, you know, basically. Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, uh, I'm writing a piece on Yarvin for Common Will. That's a follow up to the Dugan one. Uh, it should be out, I guess, around the spring, maybe late winter. Doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, uh, Yarvin, I think, is a very similar figure to Dugan uh, in that he took a lot of really quite banal reactionary ideas, uh, particularly from people like Demetra, but especially people like Carlisle, right? Uh, and updated them uh, with a 21st century postmodern vocabulary, right? Uh, think about, you know, the term red pill that he helped bring into the right-wing lexicon, right? That was a pretty clever bit of syncretism and pop culture, uh, pop culture uh, incorporation or reinterpretation, right? Uh, just to kind of jazz up again some of these far-right ideals. Uh, in terms of, again, his substantive contribution, uh, I don't really see it as being any different from the kind of things, again, Demaestra and Carlyle argued all the way back in the day, right? Uh, there's this notion that most people genuinely don't want to participate in politics. If anything, they want to be relieved of the burden of political participation. Uh, not only that, the average person, for reasons related to IQ and other things, is incapable of making meaningful contributions to politics. Uh, yet, nevertheless, because of the appeal of demotic and egalitarian language to the masses, uh, he thinks it's gained real traction and real power. Uh, and there's this almost conspiratorial, not almost, very conspiratorial idea that egalitarianism has become so powerful that you know, in this cathedral, uh, an ambiguous body of intellectuals, cultural forces, uh, hegemonic institutions, right, uh, is all working to kind of make the world more equal over time. Uh, and sometimes this pushes him in very bizarre directions. Uh, I don't know if you saw his debate with my very good friend, Ben Burgess. Did you watch I, that? I did, I did, I did. Yeah, I mean, at that point, Curtis was trying to argue that, in fact, the Western allies uh, were trying to help the Soviet Union uh, and the Bolsheviks early on in the Civil War. Uh, and then when Ben pointed out that every historian points out that, in fact, the Western allies intervened on the sides of the whites uh, to try to restore the parliamentary regime that existed before the Bolshevik Revolution, or maybe even the Tsarist regime, uh, Curtis was like, was like, well, yeah, but if you look at official historians, obviously they're going to agree with you. Uh, it's a very, very kind of funny moment, right? Uh, so I don't really see him as making a substantive intellectual contribution outside of far right spaces where he's been very intellectual. Uh, what he's done rather like Dugan again is updating a lot of this terminology for the 21st century to make it appealing to a millennial and I guess now a Gen Z audience. Right. Um, and he's been very successful about that. Uh, getting lots of money from Peter Thiel probably doesn't hurt uh, in that respect. Right. But we need to confront these figures uh, and demonstrate why it is that they're wrong, whether or not their ideas have a lot of substance to them because they're appealing, uh, which is what I set myself out to do. So is that is that why you feel the need to like review conservative books? Because you know, you, you're on a crusade to do that because you read every bad conservative book set, every conservative book set essentially comes out. And it's not fun often nope. when you have people like uh, Dave Rubin. So why do you do that? Why do you put yourself to that? You know, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people ask me that, and I've never had a good answer. So I'll try to have a good answer this time. Uh, you know, I had a pretty weird upbringing uh, in that I was raised Roman Catholic uh, and a lot of the churches I went to were pretty conservative, uh, but my family was fairly liberal. Uh, but the town I lived in was very conservative, but the school I went to was very left wing, right? So I kind of had this really eclectic array of cultural and personal influences when I was younger. Uh, and that always made me a bit interested uh, in what people who disagreed with me had to say, 
uh, partly because I had to be interested in what they had to say. I mean, most of my buddies growing up in Stittsville were pretty right-wing guys, still are, right? Uh, so, you know, we'd have conversations about that. So I guess psychologically, I was just predisposed to that from the very beginning. Uh, in terms of the more specific academic -y reasons why I end up doing what I do, uh, it was actually just seeing people like Peterson and Rubin and Stefan Molyneux and a few others say that kind of bullshit line that, oh, nobody wants to debate us, right? Uh, or Ben Shapiro said the same thing, right? You know, we challenge all these left wingers. None of them actually want to debate our ideas because they're also reasonable, also re logical, also rational, whatever the term happens to be, right? And irrefutable. Uh, and whenever somebody is from the other side is pushing you like that, there's a kind of inclination to say, well, we'll see about that. You know, if you want us to debate you, then that's what we'll do. Uh, so there was that kind of mundane reason. Uh, but I suppose the third and most important thing was uh, I think that progressives and liberals made a mistake in assuming that the best way to confront reactionary ideas uh, was to effectively act as if they didn't exist, right? To not platform them was usually the rhetoric used. Uh, the contention being that, well, by platforming them, you give them legitimacy. Now, I don't deny that is a danger, right? Uh, and it's something that we need to be cautious about. And I don't think that leftists should just be debating any old white nationalist who sends them an email being like, you know, fuck you, argue with me, right? Uh, but when it comes to figures like Peterson, Rubin, uh, or Dugan, uh, who are already extremely famous and extremely influential, uh, we're not platforming them by confronting their arguments. Uh, they already have giant microphones that they use to advance their positions. Uh, and in those kind of cases, we really need to step up and say, here's why you're wrong comprehensively and clearly. Uh, and I think that means that we need to take seriously the Millsian injunction. Uh, to know and understand their ideas in their strongest possible form so that we can rebut them as comprehensively as possible. So I guess that was the kind of big picture reason why I ended up doing what I do. Well, I agree with that approach and it's something that I've adopted to the you know Indian right wing as it were, because yeah. one of the things that I feel that the, in, the Indian left suffers from the exact same problem. So on one hand, you have like Indian right-wing intellectuals or writers getting very, very popular. And the Indian left completely refuses to engage with them because, you know, they're apparently fascist or whatever. You know, those are convenient labels, but it, 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 the fact that they're popular means that they, their arguments needs at least a serious consideration, at least a serious rebuttal. And I do not see any a lot of Indian leftists reading, even forget about reviewing critically their work, they don't even read. And that is a major problem because that uh, reinforces the, uh, the perception from the people who are influenced by their right that, you know, they really don't have any answer, that they don't want to engage or blah, blah, blah. And all of that is not good for the left. So, so it is, I think the left globally needs to engage with the right because the right is not a force that can be ignored. It's, it's simply a matter of fact that it's getting more popular across the world and you need to engage with those figures um, because otherwise you'll lose a lot of your own figures to them. You know, if you be reduced to the sort of silos, intellectual silos or glass houses, which is Absolutely. never a good. I know, I completely agree. And I have to say, uh, having looked at some of your own tweets and comments about this, uh, I'm really happy you're doing that because Modi, uh, Modiism needs to be taken down quite a few pegs, right? Uh, and certainly um, no one I can think of is better equipped to do that than you. But I just want to say also kind of adding to that, uh, I have seen that the Indian right is very much like the worldwide right, at least from the little bits that I've seen, uh, in that this articulating of itself as somehow uh, not being allowed to share the same cultural space as the left uh, and being denied access to the platforms of the left. All that serves rhetorically uh, to imply that there's something countercultural or dangerous uh, or sexy about their ideas, right? They can't really be handled. Uh, and you can see that even with the labels uh, that people will apply to them, you know, the dark enlightenment, uh, 
or you know the intellectual dark web, right? These kind of mysterious, glamorous, uh, kind of you know taboo, but in a neat way, uh, kind of labels. Uh, and the thing is, when you actually break into their ideas, you realize that a most of their arguments are really bad, right? Uh, intellectual is used uh, as a descriptor, uh, not as an honorific, right? Because there's nothing really that substantive about it. And secondly, there's nothing really all that sexy about their ideas. A lot of it is just good old fashioned anti-democratic authoritarianism, patriarchy, uh, misogyny, you name it, uh, jazzed up uh, with a couple of really cheesy pop cultural references uh, to things like the matrix. Uh, and oddly enough, a lot of other works by left-wing authors like Deleuze and Derrida. So they can't even come up with their own kind of sexy terminology, right? Uh, and we should not be afraid to go out there and expose these people, uh, not necessarily as frauds, uh, but as really deflated uh, and def odd and unimpressive uh, kind of figures, right? Uh, I think the model there could be somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft in her response to Edmund Burke. Right. Uh, Edmund Burke is often taken to be, rightly so, uh, the founder of modern conservatism. Uh, and people forget that his reflections of the revolution of France received a lot of sustained answers from progressives. Uh, the best one being Mary Wollstonecraft's The Declaration of the Rights of Man, uh, where she said, you're kind of a joke, right? Like, there's really no arguments in your book. There's just a lot of really bellicose rhetoric prettied up with a lot of fancy phrases. Uh, and she says, if there is anything like argument in your book that I can find, and I can't find many of them, it's that we should revere the rust of antiquity uh, with this kind of pious uh, or childlike uh, reverence. Uh, and she says, yeah, that's a kind of nice thing for an author, uh, the author of a pulp novel to say. Uh, but the reality is that if the ivy uh, is beautiful but entangles new growth, anybody would decide to chop it down. And then she goes on to deconstruct his arguments one after another. Uh, and by the time you're done reading The Declaration of Man, Burke still comes across as a lot less significant of a figure as before you read it, right? That's the kind of thing I think we should be aspiring to do. And she does so in very beautiful, crisp, well-argued prose, right? Uh, without any kind of attempt to glamorize what it is that he's doing. Or Eric Cosbaum, another good figure there, uh, who is very effective at these kind of things. But I also think that the global uh, left, or the, uh, let's say the global intellectual circle, at least needs to engage with the intellectual thoughts around the world. Because what I see in a lot of critiques of, you know, from the United States is, is a sort of complete dismissal of Indian thought by labeling it as fascism, which is not a good thing to do. For instance, I recently read oh, yeah. uh, Jason Stanley's uh, book. Um, I think it's called How Fascism Works. Yeah. Um, so in that, he has two references to the Hindu nationalist movement, and in both, he's basically saying that it's fascist. Well, it's not a good way to go about it because uh, it's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And the critique needs to be very specific. And I do not see that engagement of the global left. Plus the intellectual, say, say the Indian right, the walks that the Indian right is coming up with recently mm -hmm. is under the framework of decolonialism. You know, decolonialism. You know, mm -hmm. It is the, the framework that uh, Walter Mignolo, the Latin American scholars, the same framework that they use. And I do not see a left-wing critique to that. And part of the reason is because the left-wing also uses that framework in India. Oh, yes. So it, it's like, it, it's almost like the problem is that you have different enemies. That, that's all, you know, the, the teams are different, but the framework is the same. So that is one of the issues that comes up. The second is you're just not willing to engage with that argument at all. Uh, you know, the recent book that, you know, the decolonialism is a book called India that is founded by uh, J. Sai Deepak. So he's a very popular traditionalist, Hindu nationalist intellectual. And I do not see a sustained response from either the Indian left or the Indian right. Second, I think that the global left needs to engage with the global right mm -hmm. because uh, 
criticisms like for the concept of secularism, for instance. Right. So one would argue that secularism is in fact a universal concept, which is you know something that I believe in. And the response, the critique to that comes from countries like India, comes from countries which are you know, basically developing. And you know, Jacob de Ruber and Essenbach and Rada Ockin, all of these are very niche scholars, but they've the critique of secularism is essentially that it's a Christian concept. It does not apply to civilizational nations like India or China. So uh, that is why secularism shouldn't be applied to these countries. And that meets a critique from those who believe in secularism as a universal concept. So, a lot, so I think there needs to be more of that, you know, basically, you know, that is point that i'm trying to make oh absolutely and i should say i'm always for intercultural or interreligious dialogue uh when it's conducted comprehensively right there's a lot of really bad uh quick mm. takes uh, on other cultures that people can engage in that i think are disrespectful and also anti-intellectual right uh so you know <laughs> I, I've been meaning at points to try to understand more about Hinduism, both to try to understand Hindu nationalism and, you know, for my own edification. Uh, it's a project that I've never been able to engage in successfully at this point uh, because I decided to look into Russian fascism and Russian nationalism instead, right? But it's on the agenda for the future, right? But uh, just in terms of being able to maybe not speak, uh, but at least to have a sense uh, of other cultural registers and other cultural struggles. Obviously, I think that's extremely important, right? Uh, and for instance, just to make uh, a kind of strategic point to that effect, I think there's a lot the left could learn right now from what's going on in Latin America, for example, right? Where we've seen extraordinary successes uh, up and down the region, right? Uh, now, Latin America is a very complicated, uh, internally extremely diverse region. So whether or not some of these things can be generalized, who knows, right? Uh, but it certainly can't hurt to talk about, uh, talk with activists in Chile or Brazil uh, or Mexico and see how it is that some of these successes uh, have occurred, right? Uh, and, you know, my wife is Mexican, so she's been a very helpful guide for me uh, in that respect, right? Uh, so there's that point, right? Uh, to the point about fascism uh, and the kind of ready application of this label, I completely agree with you that I think it's extremely problematic to apply that carelessly uh, or to gain rhetorical advantage, right? Now, I can understand the impulse to do so because it is a very powerful term to slander someone with. And if you don't like them and it sticks, uh, then it's highly problematic for the people that it sticks to, right? But it does lead to a dilution of the technical meaning uh, of the term and the ideology and uh, practices to which it refers, right? Uh, now, part of the problem with this, as I'm sure you know, is that fascism is infamously hard to pin down. Uh, mm -hmm. descriptively, right? Uh, in fact, I would argue it's only in the 1990s that a, a good description uh, of what was sometimes called now generic fascism was given by uh, Roger Griffin, uh, you know, as palygenetic ultranationalism with a few other addendums, right? Uh, and I think that Griffin is right that earlier definitions of fascism tended to define it too readily, and I include Marxism in this, uh, by what fascists were opposed to, not in terms of uh, what it was substantively committed to. Uh, now, when you understand fascism as palygenetic ultranationalism, uh, you can see why Dugan, for instance, falls very readily within that tradition, right? Uh, this Eurasianist concept uh, is very, very in keeping uh, with the ultranational imaginary that you saw figures like Avola or Schmidt uh, give in to intellectually, right? Uh, whether or not you could apply the fascist label to the BJP, BJP or Modi or some uh, Hindu nationalists, that's something that I would actually defer to you on. Right. Uh, I don't know. Right. I've heard intelligent people make the claim uh, that Modi was is a fascist right? or at least has fascist inclinations. Uh, and obviously there is a weird fascination uh, with fascism that you could see in certain Indian right intellectuals and Hindu nationalists. Right. So there could be a genealogical connection there. But I'm, again, just not uh, intellectually or historically equipped to make that judgment call. OK. Uh, now, to. Um, your third point, uh, which is about the contextuality of our struggles, right? And the fact that reaction looks different everywhere. Uh, I think there are a number of different reasons for that. And it's a very complicated subject, but I'll just give the very simplest reason for that, uh, which is that reactionary, our right politics looks different everywhere because 
established institutions and power structures look different everywhere, and they're justified on very different ideological bases, right? Uh, and it's important to note that the right doesn't even look the same in any given country because there are some rightists who are more conservative in any given country and that want to maintain existent power structures. And there are rightists within different countries that might actually look at conventional institutions as insufficiently egalitarian or insufficiently robust in trying to get back to the left and want to enact a conservative or right revolution uh, to establish a more stringent kind of hierarchy, right? Which is what you saw, for instance, uh, with a lot of the rhetoric around the Trump campaign, right? This idea that the Republican Party was giving in to liberalism and it needed a strong man in order to repair it, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so since things look different everywhere, then it really is incumbent upon us as leftists to confront and understand it uh, in all of its manifestations, uh, wherever it happens to rear its head, which is going to be an independent task depending upon where it is you are, although one that can draw on the lessons of other people who critique the right okay, uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, so just to go back to the initial point, uh, I don't know how one could go about criticizing Hindu nationalists uh, successfully because I don't know enough about that literature or that context. I can tell you, however, that right-wing discourse tends to rhyme wherever it is that appears. So there's plenty of stuff that I'm sure you could draw inspiration from if you look at how it is that, you know, Coy Robin critiques the right in the United States or how it is that somebody like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Terry Eagleton critiques the right in the United Kingdom uh, or how it is that many good Marxist leftists like Zizek have criticized uh, Orbanism uh, in the EU, you name it, right? Yeah, so I agree with all of that. Um, in fact, Hindu nationalism started out as a reactionary movement. It's originalized in reaction to the other, as it were, uh, in the late 19th century. So also to the point that you made about uh, Indian right-wing figures being fascist, there can, there is a credible argument to be made for that. You know, in fact, uh, yep. Savarkar, uh, one of the founders, the one who coined the term Hindu, you know, the father of Hindu nationalism, basically, uh, his profile was published by the Nazi propaganda magazine. Uh, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Go on. Sorry. So, and, and RSS, you know, P.S. Munje, the former of the RSS is a voluntary organization, which, uh, you know, the precursor to BJP basically uh, is the cultural part of the Hindu nationalist organization, non political claims to be non-political. Uh, it still wears these short pants. It used to be, you know, they're wearing long pants now, but their dress uniform was basically modeled on the Italian fascist. So Munje actually met uh, Mussolini and he was inspired by that to form this paramilitary organization. So, mm -hmm. so there is a credible argument to be made. My problem is that it is not just that. So yep. a serious look would also find other intellectual influences. Also that fact, you know, like Mazzini, for instance, has been a huge influence on uh, Hindu nationalism. Uh, or for that matter, Indian influences, you know, because a lot of these figures operated within their own teleology. So to reduce them to one thing is simply not fair. To point out the similarities between that, uh, uh, the influences that they've had from fascism is perfectly fine. Uh, my problem I, I is- I would actually just like to add one quick comment to that effect. A, a good example of the contextuality of what you're talking about would be the distinction between Hindu nationalism's approach to Islam, for example, and something like Dugan's approach to Islam, right? So uh, Dugan is a Russian fascist who actually has a lot of good things to say about Islam, uh, particularly as a kind of countervailing force uh, to the West and a potential ally for Eurasianists who want to struggle against, uh, you know, Western liberalism in the United States and all that stuff. Uh, from what I've encountered, I've very rarely seen any Hindu nationalists have anything good to say about Islam or Muslims uh, at all, right? Uh, even though, again, they might ape very similar kind of rhetoric to somebody like Dugan. Yeah, well, Islam is the main enemy. Islam is the other. So Hindu nationalists, I, I don't think they have anything good to say at all about Islam. Um, but yes, I want to turn to bad conservative books now because uh, <laughs> it is fun to talk about that as well. Uh, 
So what I'm witnessing to, you know, by reading all of these conservative books, which I read for fun, because a lot of them are just dumb and they make me feel smart. Because it's so because I don't have to even look up the references to report them. So it's it's very easy. Um Gav Sart, for instance, or Dave Rubin, oh, yeah. those were the two dumbest books that I've read. And somehow the professor of uh, evolutionary biology with a PhD managed to be was sent Dave Rubin. Uh, and much more narcissistic, I, I might add. Uh, but these views are not exactly conservative. They seem to me like uh, people who were inspired, you know, who were captured by the audience or who were inspired by the fame or the money, or whatever that that you know the popularity that it ha- brings them, the audience that it brings them. So it, it seems to me like why is there an acceptance of these figures? in conservative circles more than compared to liberal circles. You know, I don't find any liberal, uh, you know, a sudden conservative turned into a lefty and publishing a half a bad book like Gad Sanders. So I don't see a lot of grifters to the other side, but, but there's a, there are a lot of grifters on the right. Why are they more accepted? That's a very good question. Uh, and... To understand that, I think we would really need to look deeply into the conservative cultural ecosystem uh, and the kind of things that it rewards and incentivizes, right? So uh, conservatives in the 1950s uh, in the United States, for example, uh, really saw themselves as in a moment of cultural retreat. Uh, And this is very well articulated by people like Russell Kirk uh, or William F. Buckley, right? Uh, Where they saw themselves again, almost as countercultural figures uh, fighting against the rising tide of liberal egalitarianism, modernity, however it is that they wanted to frame it, right? Uh, And they founded National Review, uh, which was one of the first and most important Anglo-conservative publications of the 20th century uh, that really aspired uh, to try to challenge what they regarded as the liberal consensus in an intellectually sustained way. Uh, And it was a very high-brow pretentious at points, uh, but interesting at others kind of publication. Uh, and they really saw themselves as a serious intellectual movement that needed to confront another serious intellectual movement, liberalism or socialism, right? Uh, and there's a sense in which seeing themselves as being at the margins uh, had an intellectually purifying effect on the right. Uh, because even though there were significant grifters that emerged during that period, as you know, in any time period, just look at the John Birch Society, right? Uh, because they saw themselves and in certain were marginal at that point, uh, they really needed to do a lot to be taken seriously, right? Uh, by contrast, in the 1980s, at least within the Anglosphere, conservatism became a hegemonic movement, right? Uh, that was essentially unchallenged by a serious economic left at the very least uh, until very recently or we see the emergence of people uh, like Corbyn or Sanders or again um, the red movements and pink movements in Latin America right Uh, and one consequence of this is that conservatives could take themselves less seriously right Uh, and you saw this cottage industry emerge uh, where all kinds of far less highbrow intellectuals uh, were given free reign uh, to try to promulgate their views. Uh, And as with anything else in capitalism, it became very clear that there was an extended audience uh, for this kind of material uh, and it wanted to be catered to and catered to relentlessly. Uh, And you saw this transition really taking place around the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, People like Rush Limbaugh, for instance, in the United States, who pioneered conservative radio uh, as a kind of angry, fiery demagogue uh, and won millions of listeners as a result of that. Uh, Or if you want an even more telling example, uh, somebody like Newt Gingrich, right? Newt Gingrich uh, was professor of history, right? Uh, He was was a smart guy. Uh, And he completely reinvented himself as a populist uh, who railed against, you know, intellectual wappish elites, right, who are out of touch with the ordinary people. Uh, very, very grifty, right? Just completely ignoring uh, his own background. Uh, and, you know, he won millions of votes for that, got lucrative book contracts, uh, and everything kind of just evolved from there, right? Uh, 
And now, now, 20 years down the line, you have people like Gad Saad and Dave Rubin, uh, who are part of that same ecosystem, uh, and they make millions of dollars off of what they do, right? Uh, so it's no surprise uh, that they continue to articulate these kinds of positions. Now, I do think that there's an important thing to be done in confronting these figures, even though, as you point out, it's not uh, intellectually challenging, right? Uh, because it's important, again, to try to establish counter-hegemonic tendencies uh, to what it is that they're trying to push forward. Uh, but I think that ultimately deconstructing the right-wing cultural ecosystem uh, isn't just going to be an intellectual effort. Uh, it's really going to require profound material transitions uh, where we invent new kinds of institutions that promulgate better views uh, and hopefully in a more intellectually robust way. Do you think that the uh, state of the conservative intellectual landscape as a whole has become worse over the years? Because you know you had people like Lim F. Buckley, who, you know, for all his pompousness, for all his verbosity, yeah. at least he was interesting to listen to. At least he could, you know, articulate his position well and debate uh, with actual well-read and well-known um, left-leaning activists or anyone that he disagreed with. Um, but over the years now, we have someone like God Sad and Dave Rubin, and they did not I have no idea what is appealing about them at all because they're not charismatic. They're not saying anything new. They're repeating uh, everything that, you know, a 15 year old uh, Zen Z conservative would say, you know, they're not, there's no, and they still have Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And I think there are two things to be said about that, right? Uh, one is at an intellectual level, I think Corey Robin is very right that conservatism is at its strongest when paradoxically it has a powerful left that it needs to confront, right? Uh, you don't get reflections on the revolution in France uh, when there's no revolution, right? Uh, you get it when uh, the Jacobins look like they're about to sweep over Europe and nothing can actually can possibly stop them, right? Uh, you don't get political theology uh, when Bernie Sanders is your candidate. You get it when there's a Bolshevik revolution and a very serious communist uh, and socialist party in your country that looks like it could take power, right? Oh, we still good? Yeah, apologies. See, I, you froze for a moment. If you could repeat oh, no the last. Yeah, I said that, you know, the conservative intellectual movement has paradoxically tended to be at its strongest when it confronts a sustained left, right? Again, you get, you don't get Evan Burke and reflections on the revolution in France without the Jacobins looking like they're going to sweep over Europe and carry everything before them. You don't get Carl Schmitt's political theology or Martin Heidegger's being in time. Uh, without the SPD and a communist revolution uh, establishing the Weimar Republic uh, and looking like this is just the first step to further revolutionary agitation, right? So without a kind of powerful programmatic left to confront, uh, conservative intellectuals can indulge themselves, right? Uh, and attacking, like Ben Shapiro, you know, college students uh, as their main opponents, because you know, while the college professors might make stronger arguments uh, than they're they could possibly, but they don't have any serious cultural influence, right? They're not going to transform things in any kind of uh, grand way anytime soon. So that's the kind of uh, intellectual uh, reason I would give you. Uh, the second and more materialist reason, again, is that in a kind of postmodern capitalist context, uh, obviously the profit motive is extremely strong uh, and it just pays uh, to appeal to the average angry conservative voter uh, rather than to write complicated, long, uh, well footnoted pieces uh, for a rarefied audience, right? Uh, if you want somebody who embodied this transition better than anyone else, think about someone like Dinesh D'Souza, right? Uh, Dinesh D'Souza started his career uh, writing scholarly conservative books uh, that were still pretty bad, uh, but were you know at least presented recognizable arguments, took their opponents seriously. Uh, in fact, in one of his earliest books about uh, the conservative Christian movement, uh, he chastises someone on the right for 
not describe for lumping all left wing movements together and not taking seriously the difference between liberalism, socialism, Marxism, etc. This is Dinesh D'Souza in the 1980s being like, you've got to be careful and analytically distinguish between democratic socialism, Marxism, right? Uh, flash forward to 2020s Dinesh D'Souza, he seems to have realized that there's just vastly more money to be made in just conflating all these things together, uh, saying that, you know, everyone from Joe Biden onwards to Karl Marx is a socialist. Uh, and we need to confront them as though the very foundations of the earth uh, will be shattered uh, if we don't stop, you know, Biden from putting forward a couple of moderate uh, democratic policy shifts, right? Uh, and he made himself a multimillionaire that way, right? Uh, and he gained a huge audience uh, that would never have been remotely attracted uh, to his early, more scholarly works, right? So, yeah. That's, you know, the postmodern capitalist ecosystem for you, right? Uh, now, I should say, you know, personally, I like doing the smaller, more scholarly, intellectualized kind of analyses because I find it more um, intellectually, uh, even spiritually in some ways, fulfilling, right? Um, and I wouldn't want to do otherwise. But, you know, it's definitely not lucrative. Let's just put it that way, right? You know, it's fulfilling in different ways. Okay, we're good. Yes. So one of the things that I observed in recent conservative movements, um, the pattern, because I've been following uh, the political landscape since I think 2015 or 2016. And it right. seemed for a while in 2015 that, you know, we were over some issues that, you know, we were talking more about economics and things like that. And, and that the issues of like same-sex marriage or abortion, you know, they were done and dealt with and that we won't come back to it again. Right. Because that, that is the time when you had uh, you know, a little later on, you know, the intellectual dark way prop up and all of these uh, self-styled centrist figures who became influential in conservative circles and they didn't seem that extreme. Fast forward to now, we're basically seeing Ben Sapiro, you know, talk of Ben Sapiro's daily wire and his uh, Matt Walls and uh, Michael Knowles, all of the failed actors that right. he has, talk about how, you know, aliens wouldn't like same-sex marriage. That's why we said ban same-sex marriage is not natural <laughs> yeah. or the anti-vaxxing stuff. Uh, Jordan Peterson, who seemed moderate at first, is now tweeting every day on, you know, how climate change is a myth or doesn't exist. So it seems like we have kind of, the conservative movement has kind of regressed. Do you feel that the conservative movement over the years has become more extreme? Do you think that this is something that was perhaps hidden within the movement and it's just now coming out because uh, of the Supreme Court judgment and because there is an audience for it and there wasn't maybe in 2015? Yeah, I, I think that actually these kind of tendencies or potentials were always latent within the movement to begin with uh, and actually sometimes found expression. Uh, they just weren't regarded as extreme because they were presented in a less rhetorically grandiose way uh, back in th time periods like the 1980s, right? Take somebody like Ronald Reagan, right? A lot of what Ronald Reagan did uh, from imprisoning millions of people, uh, you know, there are more people in jail in the United States under Reagan than there were in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, right? Uh, there's the land of the free for you, right? Uh, you know, it, it mean in all kinds of countries, uh, certainly in Latin America, causing mass destruction, uh, but he did so in a genteel, soft kind of powdery way uh, that presented these kinds of very extreme policies is just commonsensical, right? Uh, and part of the reason he was able to do that is conservatism was enjoying a moment of kind of mass hegemony, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, especially in the Anglosphere as well, right? Uh, and so the kind of radicalness of what was going on uh, was concealed by these genteel kind of platitudes uh, that so came to define Reaganism, right? Uh, but now, you know, a lot of the people are just being far more insistent uh, about doing the same kinds of things, uh, but doing so in a more transparently uh, 
pronounced kind of rhetorical fashion, right? So I think that's important to take note of, right? Uh, but in terms of why it is that say moderate figures can transition uh, to these kinds of more dramatic positions. I think that there are two things to be said for this. Uh, one is just that there's been a transition towards a more digital atmosphere uh, where people are very online now, including uh, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson. Uh, and in the early 2000s, there was this kind of techno utopian hope uh, that exposure on the internet uh, to a wide variety of differentiated views might incline people to be more liberal minded, right? Uh, and actually de-radicalize them. Uh, we now know that that's not the case, right? That oftentimes what occurs are things, uh, and it goes by many different labels, uh, like audience capture, or you enter into a cultural or digital bubble, uh, and there's a kind of self-radicalizing process that occurs there. And I think you see instances of that with all of these figures, right? Where uh, you take somebody like, um, Dave Rubin, right, uh, who once presented himself as a kind of moderate classical liberal, eventually brought on uh, some of these more extreme fringe figures like Molyneux or Lauren Southern, uh, and his audience gradually helped push him to the right, along with, you know, chasing the almighty dollar that comes from uh, having an audience that wants you to go right, okay? So I think that's part of it. The second thing I think is that there's this kind of teleological sensibility that the left has never been able to wean itself off of uh, that Hirschman describes very well in the rhetoric of reaction, right? Where he says, if you look at things like uh, Jacobin rhetoric from the French Revolution through to Marxism, uh, through to even things like the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, there is this sense that history is moving in our direction, uh, which is why we characterize ourselves as progressives, right? We are progressing. Uh, humankind towards you know a better world uh, and this is inexorable uh, and it's going to happen whether the right wants it to or not uh now this can sometimes again be very rhetorically powerful you think about something like uh martin luther king's statement that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice that expresses a kind of teleological sensibility very beautifully right uh but hirschman warns us that there is no real teleology to history right uh sometimes we can make improvements uh, on the world. Uh, and sometimes this can take a revolutionary form where we take a big step forward, but there's always the possibility uh, for retrenchment, reaction, counter-revolution, uh, and for the right to radicalize uh, and not only regain ground, uh, but to go further uh, than where it was willing to go beforehand, right? And there are all kinds of examples of this, right? Uh, one of the classic examples is of course, uh, in the United States where the civil rights movement, uh, sorry, the American Civil War constituted a major emancipatory and egalitarian uh, victory uh, through the end of antebellum slavery, right? Uh, but rather than transition to even bourgeois or liberal democracy for all, uh, there was segregation, Jim Crow, uh, the retraction of hard-won voting rights for many people of color in the American South, and that lasted for almost 100 years, right? Uh, some would argue that it still persists to this day, right? Uh, and the political right was very successful uh, at undermining uh, what initially seemed uh, like a crushing victory uh, for the forces of progress, right? Uh, another good example that we can point to is of course uh, in Europe. Uh, the French Revolution uh, was a, for all its problems, right? A major victory for the ideals of participatory democracy, uh, equality, and liberty and of course solidarity. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, after the defeat of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, we saw about 30, 40 years uh, of counter-revolutionary hegemony under the Holy Alliance where many of the monarchies were restored uh, and some of them even adopted more extreme censorious policies uh, than what they had had before the revolution precisely because they were afraid uh, of where this might leave. You, you know, you think about something like Russia, right? Uh, and we can list example after example of this. Uh, so I think what the left needs to do is really wean itself off of, uh, is really wean itself off of this teleological sensibility, right? That things are just gonna go our way given along in a period of time. Uh, and so we don't really need to worry too much about conservatism because while they might win the odd victory here or there, uh, they're always going to be defeated in the long run. Uh, they very well might not be. Uh, and it's naive to think otherwise. Well, I agree, and I think that uh, you know this is why the entire the end of history debate completely failed, and you know Francis Fukuyama now keeps postponing the end of history. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is also a very 
Hegelian idea, although Hegel wasn't a progressive, but, but he also had this idea that you know, there would be an end of history. Hegel believed that he was standing at the end of history. Um, so the other thing that I've noticed in conservative uh, movement is their lack of engagement with left-wing arguments. And if you are, if you advocate for a certain political view, then I think it is you know, useful for you to articulate why you are against the other political view. But for someone like uh, Jordan Peterson or any of these conservative figures, even some Ben Sapiro, for instance, do not seriously engage with left-wing critique, with left-wing arguments. They, they, they're very dismissive about it. And they constantly misrepresent our left-wing arguments. They constantly, the best example of that would be the postmodern neo-Marxist and Peterson <laughs> that can't even name the postmodern neo-Marxists. So why do you think uh, this new conservative movement as such? Because this is this was not the case with not necessarily the case with old conservative movements. You know, there were conservative intellectuals who actually engaged, who actually bothered to read and respond to left-wing arguments. Uh, but we don't find that in contemporary conservative movement a lot. We find that in some instances, but but not uh, a lot, not much serious engagement at all. You're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. I'll just say anecdotally uh, that probably the best representative of this, uh, the representation of this that uh, I've seen recently, or at least relatively recently, uh, was that Peterson debate, uh, where he was supposed to have this big high profile discussion about Marxism with Slava Zizek. Uh, and he was widely touted by conservative media. Uh, Peterson was, as you know, the most significant conservative intellectual in the world right now. And he gets on stage and admits that he's barely even read the Communist Manifesto, right? Uh, let alone any of you know Marx's you know, real books. You know, the Manifesto is a good manifesto, right? But it's short little punchy polemic, right? It's not a serious, uh, not as serious uh, an intellectual. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't even read. Uh, Slavo Zizek's works. You know, he tweeted that he had downloaded all of his books, but then he admitted yeah. that he didn't get to any of them in stage. Exactly right, which is ridiculous, right? Uh, especially because you know some of Slavo Zizek's books are really difficult, right? Uh, like Less Than Nothing is not an easy read, but he has other shorter works uh, like the stuff for the Guardian or Philosophical Salon that are very very accessible, right? You could read through a lot of that stuff in a couple of hours uh, and. Get a lot of the gist of what he's saying and the main kind of Zizekian procedures. Anyway, that's neither here nor there, right? But that's a real representation uh, for me of exactly what you're talking about, right? This is the fact that even their premier intellectual with a PhD at a good university can't be arsed uh, to read anything by Marx for a debate about Marxism. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that, again, is what I talked about before, right? Uh, since the 1980s, conservative intellectuals haven't really been confronted with the specter, certainly of a worldwide left uh, that was genuinely committed to revolutionary change and that looked like it had a real shot of enacting something like that, okay? Uh, so it hasn't had to bother to deal with these kinds of, the kind of intellectuals pushing for something like that in a sustained way, right? Uh, now, there are some who still try to do this. I'm not saying that there are no conservative intellectuals out there uh, who haven't tried to debunk the left. Uh, probably the best figure I could think of is uh, Roger Scruton and his book, Fools, Frauds, mm. and Firebrands, uh, which I'd still say is the best right-wing critique of the left uh, that I've read, at least. Uh, and it's got serious problems, and I wrote about that in my review. I mean, it's not a great book. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, I'm a leftist. I mean, there are parts of it that are just bad, like his analysis of Dworkin or Habermas. Uh, but, you know, he reads the books, he analyzes them carefully, he acknowledges when there are some good points that they make, people like, you know, Sartre, uh, and then he lays out an argument for why he thinks they're wrong. You know, it's a real book, uh, unlike 90% of these parasitic minds or American Marxism or race Marxism or whatever it happens to be, okay? Uh, but in contrast, if you look at older conservative figures, uh, the people who really did write serious books critiquing the left, they were confronted uh, with revolutionary or transformative left movements uh, that 
were confident that they were the wave of the future and had good reason to be confident that they were the wave of the future because that looked like the way things were going, right? Uh, again, think about something like uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France. Uh, Burke wrote that at a time when the most powerful, culturally significant country uh, that was a model for monarchical absolutism uh, fell into the hands of radical Republicans uh, who were very confident that within a few decades at the very most, uh, every kind of country in Europe at the very least and its colonies uh, would emulate their approach, okay? Uh, that's a horrifying thing uh, if you're a conservative, right? Uh, and it required a sustained intellectual response from people like Burke or de Maistre, right? Uh, or if you want to use Marxism as another paradigm, uh, two of the most interesting critiques and reinterpretations of Marxism came at the end of the 19th century uh, when it was gaining a lot of traction uh, in European socialist circles. Uh, and then uh, obviously the Bolshevik revolution and the German revolution burst onto the scene and just completely transformed the, uh, the geopolitical landscape, right? Uh, but somebody like Baum Beyerwerk, right, uh, offered a sustained critique of the, of the labor theory of value, or even Ludwig von Mises in his socialism, right, uh, at the uh, end of the uh, Bolshevik revolution, really interrogated these works seriously and tried to offer an intellectual rebuttal of them. Uh, now, I disagree, as I pointed out in my piece on Mises, with a lot of his evaluations, but it was a serious intellectual effort, right, and it had to be because Again, the Bolsheviks thought that revolution was going to break out everywhere, and they weren't necessarily misguided in holding to that, right? Uh, or you can look at somebody else like Joseph Schupenter, right? Joseph Schupenter is a fascinating figure uh, who I think even leftists can profitably read and learn from, uh, because what's fascinating about his book, uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, uh, I never remember if it's Capitalism, Democracy, and Socialism, but I think it's Capitalism. So, anyways, I read it a long time ago, uh, is that he actually makes the claim that Marx is probably right. Socialism is almost certainly going to be the future. Capitalism is driven by these fundamental contradictions. Uh, and he says, this is a terrible thing. Uh, we're going to end up in a world where the kind of entrepreneurial spirit underpinning creative destruction uh, is going to disappear. Everything's going to be replaced by managerial bureaucracy. We're going to see a reduction to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and so with Schubert, there's a really creative reinterpretation uh, of these kind of Marxist teleological visions about the end of history to try to suggest that what's going to happen is when we reach socialism, it's going to look really boring and really banal, not really uh, transcendent and really inspiring, right? Uh, and you wouldn't get a book like that written today because Schupiter was writing at a point where, again, it looked like the kind of entrepreneurial hypercapitalism that he endorsed uh, was a thing of the past. Or for that matter, if we Add libertarians, although I don't think libertarians are conservative. Uh, no. People like Frederick von Hayek or yeah. uh, uh, Robert Nozick, of course, uh, he's one of my favorite philosophers because his book is oh, yeah, just great. Yeah. A, an excellent book as a philosophical book, whether you agree or disagree. It's fun to read, it's intellectually challenging, and it makes, I think, the best case for um, libertarianism that I've ever come across till now. Uh, but but libertarians are not conservatives, definitely. Uh, as far as what what do you think are the modern contemporary books that you've read, which are actually decent conservative work? Now I I read recently Yoram Hasni, which I think was good enough. Yeah. Um, George F. Will. Yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, there are a few. I mean, both of the figures that you recommended, I think, make a intellectually compelling, sustained argument for their particular approaches to conservatism. In Hazoni's case, uh, you know, national conservatism, conservative democracy, historical empiricism. There's a bunch of different terms he floats around in it, right? Uh, and I mean, I wrote a review critical of the book that I stand by, uh, and there's some more stuff on that in my new book. Uh, but, you know, say whatever you will. Uh, conservatism as a rediscovery is a real book, right? Uh, it doesn't deal very well at all uh, with the liberal or the left tradition, but in terms of making a substantive argument for its own positions, uh, it is strong and it needs to be rebutted. I think that Will's book on the other end of the spectrum, arguing for a kind of liberal or ordered liberty conservatism uh, is interesting. Uh, 
it definitely doesn't seem to be all that popular because it's not intellectually faddish at the moment, but you can see it is almost like 600 tons of intellectual concrete trying to buff up uh, the neoconservative or ordered liberty conservative movement. And I wrote a reasonably positive review of it for Ariel criticizing some of its ideas. I think it's worth reading if that's the kind of thing you're interested in critiquing or understanding. Uh, I think the greatest conservative thinker of the era, though, uh, just in terms of the intellectual substance of his arguments, uh, is Patrick Deneen. Um, so Patrick Deneen uh, is easily, I think, the most interesting, systematic, uh, and erudite of the so-called post-liberal intellectuals that have emerged in the United States uh, since the early 2000s. Uh, and his why liberalism failed uh, and democratic faith both offer serious challenges, uh, both to liberals and democratic egalitarians. Uh, and I try to respond to that to a certain extent in my book uh, that should be coming out early next year, uh, particularly the democratic faith book, which I think is the best one that Deneen has written. Uh, and it's hard to even say um, how one could criticize the substance uh, of his own alternative because uh, he has a new book that's coming out uh, this year, actually, that's putting forward his vision for a post-liberal society. Uh, and you better bet that I'm going to be reading it and offering a critique of that uh, when it comes out, right? But I think Deneen is just far and away, after Roger Scruton, the most important Western uh, conservative that people need to confront and rebut, uh, if that's what they're so inclined to do. So I haven't read Deneen yet, but I will. Um, in fact, I hadn't even heard of him until now. Um, so... I want to end this by uh, talking about another recent piece that you wrote, which is on Christianity and the left. You, know, you were oh, yeah. talking about Alistair McKenter. So, um, well, you think that Christianity and the left are, are religion generally and the left are reconcilable, or do you think that Christianity in particular is reconcilable with the aims of uh, the left? Okay, uh, I was actually surprised by how uh, opinionated people were on this article because I got a lot of responses, some people being like, you know, it was just always nice to hear, you know, you said what I was thinking for a long period of time, thank you. Other people being like, fuck you, you know what I mean? How dare you suggest that there's some elective in between these two? You're what's wrong with, you know, everything on the left today. Uh, and that's kind of the reaction you want from an article, really, right? You know, people who always, if you get a, you publish an article and everyone just agrees with it, uh, you can kind of bask in the warm glow of that for a little while, but it gets a little bit boring. Uh, then if you get to publish an article and everyone hates it, then obviously you feel crappy about yourself. Getting an article where there's like a 50-50 split of lovers and haters, it's like, oh, that's neat. It provoked a little bit of a discussion, right? Uh, but in terms of uh, why I wrote that, uh, I think there are two reasons, right? Uh, one is that the left seriously underestimated the power uh, of religion. Uh, for a long time. Now, not everybody, okay, uh, but many on the left did, right? Uh, there was this presumption that the dialectic of secularization was going to carry on without really much effort. Uh, and consequently, all we need to do was wait out any residual religious movements uh, before people would commit themselves to trying to achieve a materialist, egalitarian society in this life, right? Uh, since that hasn't happened, it is incumbent upon us uh, to just strategically look more seriously at the appeal of religion uh, and to try to understand how it is that the left can better, better speak uh, to these spiritual urges uh, on the part of billions around the world, right? Uh, and I want to point out, and I did point out in this piece, that Marx himself was not unaware of this. Uh, he sometimes crudely understood uh, as a critic of religion or somebody who just had nothing good to say about it. Uh, but in fact, as a good dialectician, uh, Marx is very well aware of the fact that religion plays an important functional role within alienated societies, uh, and that on the one hand, it can serve as a tool of reaction uh, by placating uh, citizens to the status quo uh, and suggesting that there's something sublime about it or suggesting that they don't need to deal with their alienation in this life because it'll be dealt with later on. Uh, however, you know, he points out at points that uh, religion can also serve as a tool of critique, right? And he was very well aware of, you know, the effect of something like Lutheranism uh, because precisely by positing 
a transcendent ideal of justice backed by God, uh, to which contemporary society is continuously compared, religion can serve this insurrectionary function because people will say, our world does not abide by the ideal world. Uh, and so this is why we need to change it, okay? Uh, and you know, that's a very sophisticated take for an atheist to make, far more interesting than somebody like, uh, say Richard Dawkins, right? With his uh, kind of crude atheism. Uh, so, you know, I think the piece was very much carrying on in this Marxist dialectical spirit. Uh, secondly, uh, I think that purely from a historical standpoint, uh, it's important to recognize that egalitarian emergements, uh, sorry, egalitarian movements do not emerge in a religious vacuum, right? Uh, and I think that's true everywhere, right? Uh, there's no denying the elective affinity between something like say Protestantism uh, and liberalism uh, or between the kind of transition to liberal Christianity that occurred in the 19th century and the emergence of the kind of questions that Marx was dealing with uh, in essays like on the Jewish question, right? Uh, so just from a historical standpoint, it's important for leftists to understand these genealogical roots uh, if we're going to get a sense of what our heritage is. Uh, and I would even go back further and talk about the roots of the left uh, in something like the Stoic movement, right? Uh, and its agitation for universal human equality uh, in the face of a kind of um, empty universe, right? Uh, and then I guess the third thing that I put forward uh, is the left, and this is, relates back to the book that I have coming out soon. Uh, the left uh, has been very entranced particularly since the 1970s, with various kinds of Nietzschean deconstructive techniques. Uh, and there are good reasons for that, because as you pointed out, they're very powerful and very interesting, and the, Nietzsche, uh, and the left does need to deal and can learn profitably from Nietzsche, right? Uh, but what's interesting is that very few leftists, with a couple of exceptions, have ever taken seriously Nietzsche's really shocking and even disturbing uh, injunction uh, that the roots of democratic, socialist, and liberal movements is ultimately in Christianity and the slave morality, right? Uh, and this can be seen in everything from the kind of utilitarian movements that were emerging in his time to the epistemology of something like Kantianism. Uh, and it really just surprised me that so many on the left would be entranced with Nietzsche and never take this religious dimension to his argument seriously. Uh, and so one of the reasons I wrote this piece also is just because uh, it's coincided with my own interest in ultimately trying to encourage leftists uh, to wean themselves off of Nietzsche uh, and look to other sources of inspiration, whether that be Marxism, Christian socialism or humanism, I'm not sure uh, what the best one is, but we should be looking for something. So I think the uh, good argument can be made that the historical Jesus, in fact, was uh, an egalitarian pacifist, so a revolutionary. In fact, I'm uh, having a guest on John Dominic Crossant, who is a scholar right. of early Christianity, and he makes the argument that the historical Jesus was in fact a pacifist revolutionary whose kingdom of heaven was actually here on this earth and who talked about uh, you know the poor, the weak who associated with the oppressed his whole life. And that was his entire goal, that was his entire purpose. And this is of course something which people like Leo Tolstoy have uh, taken mm -hmm. over. Absolutely. A lot of Christian, you know, there's a strong history of Christian anarchism, this strong history of uh, Christian socialism as well. So it is not on philosophically hollow grounds. It, it, it has been talked about before, but uh, the problem is that the modern left has not engaged in it as much. Uh, also, I would like to point out in the Indian context that a lot of the uh, revolutionaries, because the Indian, um, independence, the national movement was basically divided into the revolutionaries who, you know, resorted to violence, who believed violence is a, you know, means of thought. And then there was the movement led by the Indian National Congress, who were, you know, pacifists and advocated for non-violence. And a lot of the revolutionaries, anarchists and Marxists, um, and socialists who were committed to uh, you know, part of the 
revolutionary Indian revolutionary movement actually crafted theories that reconciled uh, Hindu religious thought into anarchism. So that there was, you know, this figure like Lala Hartya was inspired by Bakunin's, you know, anarchism, and he was an anarcho-communist. Um, so th there were multiple people. Uh, there, there were also MPD Acharya, who was also an anarchist. So these figures who were revolutionaries, who took part, who, uh, you know, were fighting, believed in political assassinations and things like that, uh, actually crafted a coherent philosophical theory, reconciling tradition and a revolutionary left. And, and that hasn't been explored much in the global left or even in India, for instance, anarchism remains um, unexplored in, in the contemporary Indian political landscape. It's only used as sort of derogatory term. So, and you, 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 I think you're probably aware of Pierre Ambedkar, who's, mm -hmm. uh, who, who attempted to combine Buddhism with his, uh, he was a very prominent, uh, he was prominently influenced by John Dewey, who was also his teacher. So he attempted to reconcile Buddhism with the, his form of Buddhism, which is Navayana Buddhism, was basically a, a re new version, a remake version without the supernatural elements, which emphasized on you know, Darian liberalism. So, so I think this needs to be seriously studied in the global circles and there can be, and there needs to be reconciliation between religion and left-wing politics because I am not someone like say the new atheist who believes that religion is just going to go away. It's, it's going to stay and you better utilize it for your own goals because, because it can be done. Absolutely, and I'd like to point out that uh, there are a number of scholars out there, including people like Jack Donnelly or Marcia Sen, who actually argue that uh, egalitarian movements were born in India uh, under the auspices of the Buddhist emperor Ashoka, uh, who some contend at least was the first figure to really argue for a universal basis for society uh, that took seriously the equal dignity of all, that respected things like uh, intercultural dialogue. Uh, that advocated for a certain degree of women's inclusion uh, that had been unprecedented, right? Uh, now, I'm not interested in saying who got there first, right? Uh, but this just does indicate precisely what you're talking about, right? That you can look in faith traditions like Buddhism and see important insights historically uh, that have mutated and instantiated themselves in interesting ways down to the present, right? Uh, and there are many good scholars that are trying to do something similar uh, when it comes to something like Christianity, right? Uh, so for instance, Dr. Aubrey Hendricks at Columbia University, who I had a good conversation with, uh, wrote an excellent book called The Politics of Jesus, right? Uh, and he's actually released another book recently about uh, the right-wing misappropriation of Christianity, uh, where he talks about how it is that uh, Jesus was somebody and his disciples uh, were figures who said things like, uh, the wretched of the earth will know that God is ultimately on their side, right? Uh, and that the kingdom of heaven will come now. Uh, and in the kingdom of heaven, all people are going to be brothers. Uh, and what we're going to see is the poor and the meek and the humble uh, will finally have their day in the sun and be recognized, right? Uh, this isn't the language of a reactionary, right? Uh, it's the language uh, at the very least of a social reformer uh, or maybe even of a social revolutionary, right? Uh, although a pacifist social revolutionary, right? Uh, and one of the things that McIntyre points out in the book that I analyzed in that piece is precisely how a lot of these egalitarian, radically egalitarian and emancipatory inclinations uh, mutated through the history of Christianity, uh, found their systematic expression in the work of Hegel, and then were ultimately picked up, secularized uh, by Marx uh, and carried forward within the Marxist uh, position um, or tradition. Now, he overstates the case, I think McIntyre does a little bit, but it's a very interesting argument. Uh, and I think bits of it are compelling. Uh, so like you, I think that the left needs to look at these histories more seriously, uh, ask ourselves what it is that we can learn from them. Uh, and if you're a secularist, uh, there's nothing wrong in saying that we should still be secularist, but not be a thoughtless secularist like Dawkins, right? Somebody who's aware of the complexity uh, of uh, 
the complex legacy of these religious traditions, right? Uh, and if you're of a religious disposition, I would hope that being aware of these kind of radical and socially emancipatory heritages uh, might lead you to rethink your own convictions about what the proper form of politics would be for somebody who is genuinely committed uh, to a faith tradition, right? And I would hope that they would transition towards a more radical interpretation of that faith tradition. Well, I absolutely agree. And I, in fact, I think that it's much more easier to reconcile uh, Christianity with left-wing politics than it is with right-wing politics. Uh, absolutely. In fact, it, it seems to me like reconciling Christianity with right-wing politics is kind of kind of leads to a cognitive dissonance uh, because how can you reconcile the fact that uh, it's easier for, you know, the famous statement that it's easier for a camel to go to a eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to the kingdom of heaven. So he is obviously, you know, constantly throughout the Bible, you find this dream, but, you know, now it's reconciled with the defense of the status quo uh, because that's what happens with uh, tradition, you know, old system as well. You know, they become uh, a part of conservative movements inevitably. Uh, well, I had great fun talking with you, and I learned a lot. Uh, Thanks. I, I, Thanks, sir. A lot of things were thought provoking. Did you enjoy the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. It's always great talking with you, man. Uh, whenever you want to do this again, send me a message, and I'm sure we can make that happen. Yeah, of course, I am sure we'll do it again. Um, all right, like, share, subscribe, and have a good day. Yeah, and uh, take care of yourself, and uh, stay safe and stay warm during the winter season, okay?